uh, of the uh, space we're talking about. Part of the problem that we've had with some of the FBI projects is actually just making sure, and that's one of the things that we're having to do now, is really take a gut check on some of the projects that have been approved to make sure that, they're, that the terms and the prospectus that, that uh, Congress has approved um, are are, are still viable numbers, so that in, in terms of what in, in ter terms in, in terms of being able to bring those projects in at the cost. Yes, ma'am. Um, so we're going back to those projects now and working with the FBI to do a gut check to see if those if if the if the requirements and the lim and the cat rent caps and the limitations in those approved projects are are really viable in this market to go out there. And, and uh, we want to make sure that it's, we feel like we feel comfortable that we can bring those in. In addition, we're, we're hiring um, a contractor to go back and look at the program requirements and take a look to see where we might be able to value engineer some of their requirements to try and save the government money and, and, and bring them in within the existing limitations of the prospectus. Um, we're also spending some time with the FBI to see if we can't um, I would think the costs have gone down. Um, well, the cost of credit has, haven't gone down. The cost of materials people, has leveled off. Are these people still trying to get the credit? These, the, these, people didn't try, these people are just now trying to get the credit? Well, in some of the projects that we haven't gone forward with yet, yes. They, they're not out on the street yet. So those are the ones that we're looking at. How many at. of these FBI projects are out on the street at this time? Um, I need to provide you that information. Would you please provide us yeah. that information yeah. within 30 days? Yeah. We'd like to know, we like a status report on the state of the FBI projects in particular, uh, this, where, how, where we are, whether at the procurement stage, at some late, later stage. We can get that for you, ma'am. Um, you, you mentioned in some of your remarks uh, in answer to prior question, uh, making the um, process user-friendly as well. That's going to be particularly important now if you want to have anybody <laughs> bidding on these projects. Um, projects are, have been worth so much that uh, the private sector has absorbed really quite outrageous costs from GSA, large, of it, large amounts of it from delay, uh, a, a, a absolutely frustrating bureaucracy. Um, people can't afford it anymore, particularly with the cost of credit. And I would hope that we would use this opportunity to make the entire process more user-friendly and save the government money, because when you save the, uh, the, these developers find a way to get their money back after you have, in fact, raked them over the coals. Those who don't get the contract, of course, are just left out in the coal, and that's a terrible thing to do, too, but it may be very much to the disadvantage of the government to leave so many out in the cold today when it's uh, when credit is so hard to come by in the first place. What comes to mind is the, the, the so-called occupancy agreement um, where uh, there have been times when the way GSA does the timing and the signing of an occupancy agreement that uh, there have been occasions where occupants have been allowed to opt out of an occupancy agreement after we're very deep into the process. Now, you would think that, bef when, when, that, that the occupancy agreement would be signed before the procurement. And what, what possible advantage of it is it to the government to allow agencies to act as if they're just free agencies, as free agents is somebody else's money, uh, I'm just going to ask uh, GSA if I can opt out, and GSA almost always bends. That's why we're going to reauthorize this statute to give the uh, agency stronger authority so that that bending will, will go. Will, but but the, the, what seems particularly wasteful uh, are uh, allowing agencies uh, to opt out of an occupancy agreement. Under what conditions? Would an agency be allowed to opt out of an agreement following a procurement and all that the agency has gone through? Uh, let, me, let me explain a little bit about that 
process for you and, and, and lead up to answering your question. The occupancy agreement, as you understand, is the agreement between GSA and its customer agency as to the terms and conditions of their space requirements. In a leasing, we have occupancy agreements not only in lease scenarios, but also for our federal buildings. In our leasing uh, program, if, if an agency is moving into lease space, the occupancy agreement basically uh, is a pass-through for the terms and conditions of that underlying lease. When we get ready to start the procurement... A pass-through for the terms and conditions. Basically, in terms of the square footage and the rent that they're going to be paying, the, they pay us what we're paying that So they're landlord. talking to you now because you're already right. on the limb for this space. Well, at the very beginning, we go to the agencies um, before we start the procurement and get that commitment from them and have them sign a preliminary occupancy agreement that is essentially their commitment to us that, we, that they want the space that they say they do and that, we're, and that they're willing to pay the estimated rent that we're telling them it's going to cost. So we don't start the process until we get... Yeah, and if you're in the private payment. sector, you do that, you're going to be held to it. Well, Why isn't an agency held to it? At the end of the day, when that lease is procured, we go back to that agency when we have those final numbers after award when we know exactly what the rent's going to be, and they sign up again a final occupancy agreement, which basically is that billing document from which they agree to pay us the rent that's um, set forth in the, in the lease that we've procured for them. Now, we don't have many agencies opting out of those occupancy agreements at that point in time. The opt-out scenario really comes during the uh, term of the lease, and we don't see that too much, but there is a regulatory provision that agencies can, if they have a change in mission, give us 120 well, Mr. Morris, days. Mr. Morris, you can rest assured I'm not talking about that. Oh. <laughs> well, in terms of... I'm talking about, I'm talking about, uh, I, that's what I want to know. If, that, if that's the condition for opting out, somehow the federal government or the Congress has changed your mission in some significant way, and your, your, your testimony is though that that's the condition for opting out, then I would be perfectly satisfied. I want to know if there are any other conditions for opting out. I think what, what we get feedback on and what you may be um, really driving at are the delays that it takes for us to get that final occupancy agreement finalized and signed with that agency. And what is it that they are negotiating during that time? Well, I with think. You? It's, it's not just the occupancy agreement itself. They should be, it's just getting them to sign it to make sure that, hey, they're, they're, they've got their requirements met. Um, the and what would delay them in signing? Here's some people who've asked GSA to go out and find them some space. Now, so tell me why, why they tell you they have not signed the agreement. We're going to deal with that in the statute, so I need to know candidly what is the reason that, that an agency would give you. Not valid reasons, I can tell you that. Well, that, thank you. They're not valid reasons. What happens... You, and I, the agency needs to be protected here. And here I, here I don't want to... I don't want to... I don't want to blame GSA, and I want to say what I think the problem is. Here, the, here is GSA charged with a government-wide mission. Not very many agencies have a government-wide mission. You deal with the public, or you deal with a particular sector. Here, here, uh, GSA not only deals with the market, the credit, the, the 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 leasing and construction sector. GSA has clients that are peer agencies. So essentially, if you are a peer agency, you know, who are you? You're just like me. Of course, you have a mandate, a very strong statutory mandate. It occurs to us it's not strong enough because those delays cost the government. When you get down to it, those delays cost the government. As if somehow these, these people um, were um, um, uh, on their own dime. Well, in a sense, they are but their own dime turns out to be the taxpayer's dime. And it, it, it has gotten to the point where the delays of that kind, which mean being deferential to the agency, uh, become so costly, uh, so that particularly as we look at the state of the markets today and what it's gonna take for it really to right itself up, I don't see how you're gonna keep the gold standard set of, of um, uh, of, of, of businesses, let's call them, because they are across the board, you deal with 
uh, unless we can make the agency far more user friendly and use this opportunity to do so. I would appreciate, Mr. Morris, um, if you would uh, undertake to look at ways that you think you, the agency could be helped in uh, serving its clients while making uh, the process more user-friendly to those who've invested money. Uh, when I say how could we be helpful, I mean there are things we could do in, 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 in statutorily. Um, there may be other suggestions, so we do need your suggestions. If we don't get them, we're just going to do what the private sector tells us uh, they need. If they're willing to come forward, I want to hear from the agency's point of view, since you've got an agency uh, responsibility to the federal government, I want to hear from you, and we'll be having hearings over the next couple of years in any way, in any case, but I, I would very much appreciate your, your doing so and making sure that those uh, under you can begin to think through, help us think through a reauthorized uh, public building service uh, statute, in effect. We're happy to do that. I would like to point out there are certain instances, not just to um, to bash our, uh, our our customer agencies. There there are time. There, I don't think they happen frequently, but there are times when an agency may resist moving into new space if they don't if they're not satisfied with the quality of the construction. Maybe the HVAC system uh, is not uh, operating properly. Maybe there's some issues with adjustments in that. Maybe there are some other um, quality of constructions that aren't being met to the government requirements, and they will be um, loud and vocal about those ty types of issues. And we've run across those from time to time, but I don't and, think and, that's And that, look, that's legitimate, obviously. Right. Uh, in fact, to, to give you a perfect example, one where the agency has moved in. And we brought considerable pressure on agencies uh, to, in fact, uh, uh, move to space, which costs the government less and is well within uh, the delineated area. And so we have the moving to NOMA, which is within the stone's floor of the Senate. Uh, one of those agencies was the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. They complained to us about the size of the spaces for lunches and heat and a number of things. And to the credit of the GSA, I said, my goodness, after we have, have um, made sure these agencies would not continue to insist upon uh, renting or leasing only in the highest cost parts of the district for us now to get back complaints that that basic in nature, heat, not enough space for, for uh, employees to eat, that doesn't speak well to the Congress, uh, speak well of the Congress or of the agency, and we have been informed that GSA has been out there and that, that, that there's a build out going on. And there, that's the kind of, of taking care of the customer that we think is, is absolutely called for. Were that uh, uh, all that we knew in our long experience about occupancy agreements, we would be very pleased. So do know that that's something we're going to be looking at in this, in this kind of climate. Anybody dare to say to somebody, oh, no, I don't think I want to go there after all. Right. That's, that's <laughs> not acceptable. It just isn't. Um, let me ask you about these, in that, in that line, these holdover, this holdover status. Uh, a witness is going to testify here that 60% of government leases enter into holdover status upon expiration. Uh, we believe this is a government-wide figure. We want to know how many leases are indeed in holdover status and where they are located. We want to know about leases in this region since so much of the federal sector is in this immediate region, but we also want to know leases government-wide. And we want to know how many leases are expiring within the next 6 or 12 months. Can you do have any of that information to give us today? Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, I'd, I'll start out by saying that holdover leases arise when we're not able to provide a replacement space solution for an expiring lease in a timely manner, and we're unable to negotiate an extension with an incumbent or an existing landlord. Now, what amounts? To, what 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 are the the difficulty in in in, in negotiating? You're trying to get a better. Uh, Rent for the uh, for the gov lease for the government, perhaps. I think uh, oftentimes it has to do with pinning down the requirements for that agency that's in that space. 
believe me, the, a holdover is the worst case scenario and should be avoided if at all possible. Um, Do most of these agencies want to remain in that space? Well, it really depends. Um, a lot of them do, and that's one of the things that we're really working on um, because, you know, when we're going out for a new requirement, um, we, we typically go out and have full and open competition. That's our, that's our modus operandi, if you will. But there are plenty um, of situations, and quite frankly, you touched on it in one of the hearings that we had last summer, where the tenant agency's requirements haven't changed. Um, they are happy where they are. Um, and um, in those uh, cases, the federal regulations allow for a concept of uh, entering into negotiations for a succeeding lease with that incumbent landlord. We have to um, do a market analysis to see if what the rents are like in, in that area, in that market, see what we're paying under the current lease. We have to factor in things like moving cost, and we actually have to go to the public and advertise um, that we do have a continuing need for space in that market um, and request uh, expressions of interest from the market. If we get expressions of interest from other providers of space, then we have to make a decision based upon the numbers of whether or not it's worthwhile to go into a full and open, uh, open competition. If there are um, no uh, bona fide expressions of interest, then we're free to, at that time, go ahead and, and negotiate another deal with that landlord. There are plenty of those situations around the country um, through in, in every region, and one of the things that my office has been doing to try and address the problem of the number of expiring leases that we continue to face each year and our inability to replace those leases in a timely fashion is to use that as an important tool to say, look, if you know that the agency requirements aren't changing, if you go through this regulatory process, you factor in the market uh, analysis, you look at the moving costs, you seek expressions of interest, and and the uh, results of those efforts say, take a look at negotiating with that current landlord, then right now, especially in these times when, when rent rates are not rising, they're flattening, we need to go long. We need to negotiate the best deal we can and lock in on not a year extension, but go long and at least go out there five to seven years where we can take advantage of but the market rates sake, yes. and we can stabilize is that, that, is that landlord's happening? building. You know, that's like ABCs of how to, to operate in this kind of market if you have the leverage GSA has. Um, is there anything written to regions to tell them to proceed in that way? We wish we issued a realty services letter just this past, uh, in the, this past year on that very subject, reminding them of this regulatory authority and encouraging the regions to use this whenever they have the opportunity, when the situation meets. Now, when you've got a brand new requirement coming in, we're typically going to be going to the market and doing a full and open competition. But that's not the case in, in, uh, in and, every you know, situation. You're not going to this market and doing much of a, you know, the, 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 you know that, that, that looks like a, you know, another bureaucratic turn of, of, of events. Um, One of the other things that we're trying to do now is actually get information out to the regions on a quarterly basis about what the market rates are, what the market conditions are in major metropolitan areas around the because country. Because then all you have to do is, uh, it seems to me, is to factor in the moving costs. Well, that's true. Um, what we're doing is, is getting them information in all the major metropolitan areas on a quarterly basis to say, here's what rent rates are for general purpose office space in these markets. And by the way, here are our current leases that are expiring over the next 12 months, 24 months, 36 months and beyond. So you've got leases that are expiring in these markets and what we need to be doing is planning now as soon as possible to take advantage of the current market conditions and go long where you can. Um, we've seen trends over the last year and a half, because we do this on a quarterly basis, where rents have continued to flatten and in many markets have started to fall somewhat, and this is an excellent opportunity for Mr. us to try Morris, to take advantage uh, the, of that. The subcommittee will hold the agency uh, very responsible if you do not take advantage of this market to renegotiate these rents or to extend these rents or to move because this is the time to do it if you have if you're in the gsa if you're an individual you, uh, you're stuck there's not much you can do 
Um, that, and that's why I want you to get to us uh, the list of the holdover uh, leases, their status, uh, and also leases that will be exper uh, expiring in six to 12 months. And uh, what you say you're doing, I'm sure, has something to do with the fact that the subcommittee required you to do some central uh, uh, centralizing, once again, of leasing. Uh, and let me say that the holdover rate is, is really rather small as a snapshot of our whole portfolio. Um, the, what we end up seeing 60 is... 60 percent enter into, according to an upcoming witness, enter into holdover status upon expiration. I don't know... For That's not correct. It represents about 4 percent of our overall portfolio. We have 8,600 leases in our portfolio. We have about 300 leases that are in holdover at this point in time. It represents about 4 percent of our total yeah, inventory. You'd have to say percentage of those expiring. It's about 13 percent of our total leases expiring in 2008. Now, where the problem is, we're not replacing all those leases. We're doing, uh, and this is where I think we're getting some pushback from the private sector. They're not all going into holdover status. There are a number of leases, and there are about 40 percent of our leases that are expiring that are being extended on a short-term basis. To me, a holdover lease is when you don't even have lawful possession of the premises. You're, you're, you're squatting, in effect. You have to extend it on a short-term basis. Because they're well, holding over. Well, some I the, mean, the holdover you scenario. Got extended that, you know, well, you, what is you know, what is it? You know, this is not some apartment we on a month to month, or maybe that's what you're talking about. No, well, the, well, the holdover is the land is is the situation where the landlord has said, "I'm not going to give you an extension. We want you out of here." And we're trying to negotiate uh, a short-term extension for a year or a two-year extension while we get the agency requirements finalized so that we can effect a final solution. But um, do you have the staff and the talent to do that quickly? Um, we have laid out this past year um, uh, a plan uh, nationwide, and we'll be happy to, to share that with you to try and reduce the extension problem that we have with our expiring lease load. Um, we are, um, we actually are increasing the staff um, above what it has been um, nationwide. We've been somewhat successful in that endeavor, not as much as we'd like. We need more people not only to do work in-house, but actually to manage our broker program as well. So as you became, as you well aware, you're well aware of, and we talked about it, I know, last summer, just the staffing needs in our leasing specialists. I will say we've, we've done, we've made some progress just this past uh, week. Um, we kicked off uh, a week of a, a, what we call our boot camp in the public building service where we bring brand new people that have joined the organization in for a week's worth of training in Washington. And I had the pleasure of meeting 15 new leasing specialists from regions around the country who just started with the agency, many of whom had come from the private sector, and others we had actually recruited recruited from other federal agencies where they had been doing uh, realty work. And so we had a, it was like a freshman class of brand new realty specialists from around the country that were in Washington for a week of training and I got to meet with them and talk to them and uh, we had a reception after, but, but they were more than enthusiastic. They were really quite excited about joining our organization and trying to make a difference. And, and we talked about this is a time where the, where the country's having uh, economic difficulties and um, I hate to uh, say it, but it's an opportunity. I, I hate to say it in the sense that we don't want to have bad economic times, but it is an opportunity for the government to try and make the most of it. Um, thank you, Mr. Morris. Mr. Morris, I'm, I'm, I'm just about finished here. I'll ask Ms. Edwards if she has any questions for me. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Morris, for your testimony. I want to go to the go back to this question of um, of the lease expirations because my reading of the upcoming testimony is that um, of the uh, leases that are in extend that there are 60 percent of your leases that are expiring that are extended. That's true. Thank you. That's true. Not holdover, but extended. Right. 
extended. And so, but even still, 60% extended, it seems to me not only does that represent kind of an unfairness to the government and to the taxpayer, but it perhaps represents an unfairness also to the, um, the landlords. Um, in terms of their ability to project what their what their business opportunity is going to be, I mean, sixty percent seems rather extraordinary. That's uh, I think that's a valid point. Um, there are bona fide cases where extensions um, will occur if we are moving clients. And when I say clients, if we're moving customer agencies into a federal building or new lease space, and there have been delays in the completion of that new space um, for whatever reason we may have to extend the lease for a short period of time until we can actually accomplish the completion of their new facilities and move them in. I think but, all, of us all of us understand that. But on a portfolio basis, um, it is uh, my belief that it is entirely incumbent when the government enters the marketplace to contract for lease space that they have an obligation to, co to respond in a commercially reasonable fashion. And it doesn't do the government any good to what I call do serial extensions of leases one year after another where we're not able to lock into a long-term uh, 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 lease to house the government. And I believe you're right. We are getting pushback from our private sector landlords who are saying, we need stability in our portfolio, in our building, and we need to know what you folks are going to do, and we have an obligation to be able to deal with that. Well, I appreciate that, and I look forward to hearing from you um, and, and from the agency in the near future about the progress on that, because I share the view of the chairwoman that we are actually, you know, in a, a great position as, you know, for the government, uh, for the taxpayer to get a really good deal on a long-term lease opportunity in this current market, and we should take full advantage of that, and so we shouldn't come back here um, in another several months still discussing 60 percent um, extension rates um, for, uh, for open, for expired leases. I want to go to another um, set of questions, and it really has to do with this region, with the metropolitan region. In, in addition, in some upcoming testimony, we see a chart um, that shows the amount of uh, GSA owned and lease space in the metropolitan region. I represent uh, a significant portion of Prince George's County and some of Montgomery County. And there has been a long-standing complaint, uh, particularly in Prince George's County, that Prince George's County has not enjoyed um, in this region a fair share of GSA lease opportunities for full service lease space, not just for warehouse space. And so I'd be interested, and it doesn't have to be here, that I see some kind of, and this committee sees some kind of breakdown of how those leases break down across the region by county. Because it, you know, when I look at 18% um, of the, I think it's, yes, 18% in, the, in this region of GSA space going into suburban Maryland compared with 25% in Northern Virginia and 57% in DC, I certainly understand uh, the District of Columbia uh, numbers. I'm not quite sure I understand the, discre the, dis the great discrepancy from suburban Maryland to northern Virginia. And I dare say that when we look at suburban Maryland and break that down by county, um, that we will see that indeed it's not uh, the imagination of developers in Prince George's County um, that the county has been shortchanged. And, um, and, you know, and there is a fairness in this region, and I think that this concern isn't just about this metropolitan region, that it's replicated in other metropolitan regions, too, where there needs to be sort of a fair, you know, shared opportunity um, for GSA leasing in our metropolitan region. And I know that in my work on this, um, on this subcommittee, it will not be the last time you'll hear this question until there's you know, an answer that is much more satisfactory to the people of the 4th Congressional District. I would also um, like to ask you about, if you would, please describe the process by which, and the, and the transparency provisions by which you analyze where uh, GSA lease opportunities will take place. And I am particularly interested in the way that you both value um, the, um, the lease and uh, how you assess things like transportation, because Prince George's County has, um, I believe, the greatest number of metro 
station stops in the, in the suburban metropolitan area. And those are all stations that could be fully developed out. And so I'm curious to know how you analyze transportation as a core factor and, frankly, as a green factor um, in determining where to locate GSA leases. Um, it is a big consideration. Um, I, I, I'd like to start out by saying that we had the pleasure um, this meeting uh, this week. Uh, uh, Bart Bush, my colleague from the National Capital Region behind me, and I, along with the Acting Commissioner for the Public Buildings, had a very frank meeting with the uh, Director of Economic Development for Prince George's County, um, along with several of the um, senior um, uh, businessmen of the county, to have a frank discussion about some of the issues that you just brought up. Um, uh, and it, quite frankly for me, um, it was enlightening because I not only focused on NCR, but also the, the country at large and some of the issues that they brought to our attention, I frankly wasn't aware of. But in determining, to try and answer your question to begin with, uh, what, uh, where we go, um, transportation uh, patterns play an important role. Um, the agencies themselves that we are trying to find space for um, tell us where they come up under our regulatory scheme with the delineated area that um, they're looking for in terms of locating. Now, um, and it, they factor in a number of factors that are, are, are mission related. Um, this very topic has been a huge point of discussion with, um, with the chairman of the committee. Uh, the subcommittee and other members of the committee. Um, in fact, we are um, um, uh, now following guidelines that in our in our larger deals where the prospectus uh, uh, the prospectuses themselves contain an explanation of what that delineated area is going to be. And once that's determined and put into the prospectus, we're bound by that uh, unless there's some kind of significant change. In which case, we have to come back and notify the committee. So. The, to try and answer your question to begin with, transportation is a huge factor. Establishing the delineated area is the first job of the agencies that we're trying to locate. And then we take a look at what they tell us and say, uh, and try and consult with them and advise them on what kind of competition opportunities are there there and are they too small or and, and, and is there a need to actually enlarge that area to achieve better competition and the opportunity for better pricing? Thank you, Mr. Morris. I mean, you can um, just bet that there will be ongoing um, questions, at least from this Congresswoman, about these issues because they're profound and they deeply impact the, the ability for the district that I represent um, to enjoy the kind of economic development and prosperity that the rest of our region um, enjoys. And I can assure you as, as well that, you know, with, with 16 available metro stop opportunities um, for transportation-oriented development that GSA can participate in, um, some of us will be very, very hard-pressed to believe that you can't find some on that Class A uh, space that is, um, is located in Prince George's County, and not to take away from any other parts of the region, but as you begin to look at these leases that are expiring, and I'd be curious to know um, the numbers of the leases and the square, uh, square footages um, in the metropolitan region as these are expiring, so that you can take a new look, a fresh look, at available opportunities throughout the metropolitan region. Thank you very much. Let me just follow up because I, I would like to share with you one important um, uh, factor that they actually uh, brought to, li to, 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 to light um, in our meeting was um, the what they perceived as a disadvantage uh, the, the Prince George's County officials in terms of the availability of existing space um, obviously, in Washington, D.C., it's much more built out. Northern Virginia has a larger stock of existing buildings than Prince George's County, and so that oftentimes in these procurements, um, competitors from Prince George's County, their solution and those their space solution in that kind of procurement is going to be new construction. And that it was important to understand that if you're dealing with new construction, and that is going to be a possibility, that the pricing on existing space is not really going to carry over to pricing for new construction because um, 
it's going to, it, the costs are going to be approximately the same across the region. The, the cost of, uh, the, the point was made, the cost of concrete in Prince George's County is going to be the same that it is in the Mr. District of Columbia. Mr. Morris, the gentlelady has made a point that goes well beyond when new construction, and I'm going to put it on the record now, given your explanation to her, uh, and the leases that are due, are expiring within six to 12 months, we want the exact location. Oh, we can give you that. By county and by place in the county. And the reason, the reason that the gentlelady's questions are so apropos has to do with uh, many instances in the District of Columbia, I could cite, but a particularly shocking one from Prince George's County. Now, the reason that I want to put this on the record is because I believe that the developers in Prince George's County are sophisticated enough to have written to the chair of the committee and therefore informed me. I must conclude that throughout the United States, this same, and I'm going to call a spade a spade, redlining is occurring. This is what we found. We got this long, almost scholarly letter from a developer uh, in which he laid out what, how the procurement that you actually cited, you cited the prospectus, how the agency had in fact violated the prospectus through the amendment process. You're right. We said that these complaints about um, proceeding after the delineated area uh, to to have agencies uh, do whatever they want to have become so systematic that you can't change your perspectives without coming back and reporting. And this is what the agency did in, in Prince George, when Prince George's and Montgomery County, two very middle class counties, some of the highest, uh, highest income counties in the United States. This is not like, you know, the far in the southeast and northwest. This is how the agency handled that. Seeing that they had to come back if they were going to change the prospectus, they read into it that, well, we're not going to change the prospectus. We'll show Norton and the committee. We're going to amend the prospectus. And they trusted on us enough so that they didn't get a lawyer to come down and get to every jot and tittle to catch us. So we're going to amend it, amend it. And what did they do to Prince George's County? Here was an HHS a, a, a new facility, not entirely new, but they needed, uh, uh, they needed more space. And this is what the Public Building Service did. Uh, in absolute, unadulterated collusion with the agency, it came forward with a set of conditions that only the present Montgomery County location could possibly have met. Uh, these included places of worship, if I may say so, that one really got to me as a strong believer in the separation of churches and state, that, that we could actually have a federal government document that said that places of worship uh, was a factor in location. And then they went down a trivial list that included hardware stores, beauty, beauty salons, um, uh, 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 we're trying to remember the, the, them all. They, it, it was, it was uh, uh, as if someone went out and said, what is it around the agency today that we have? And then they said, fine, make a catalog of that put that on GSA's desk and say, get us a place where you can get that. Here was somebody trying to compete for the process, and he had the, uh, he uh, extent, oh, the one that really got us was distance from the metro. Now, the Prince George's location was closer to the metro, here where everybody's trying to change the world green before it completely boils over. Uh, they simply extended the distance to the metro, said, oh, we'll fix that. <laughs> It says, uh, um, I don't know, three, um, whatever. Well, under certain conditions, we can't extend it. 
Uh, so we'll just do that and it'll all come together. And they'll never catch us. That's why you don't see me having confidence in, <laughs> in the agency. They're here very, a very, very sophisticated developer who didn't just write me a complaint, he did jot and tittle. I couldn't believe it that under my very nose that the agency with whom I had worked so closely would do something that was abusive, <coughs> deceptive, a lie is the only way to, so we call them in. And they, they had no, you know, they, they, they tried to, to, to indicate uh, as best they can why these unheard of, uh, these unheard of conditions were put and doing it by amendment. Um, and then the staff and I sat and said, what can we do about this? And to make it worse, the RFP was already out. One of the things we don't do in the federal government, we do abide by the right rules. We couldn't then say, well, look, just throw it back and, you know, throw it all out. Uh, never, and I've been on this agency, uh, and on this, uh, I've worked with this agency ever since I came to the Congress in 1991. I, and, and I can only think that under our very noses, this was happening day and night and we never would have uh, learned about it. Well, that one instance has only been a part of a catalog now of growing instances where the agency has essentially lied to the, to the, to, 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 and, 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 and violated the express uh, written requirements of the subcommittee. When that happens enough and you have the nerve to sit here and tell her about the prospectus and, and to give her a lesson in how you go about it, when I have this outrageous example sitting before us, I want you to know that it, it angered me no end. It reduced to the level of minus zero my confidence in the agency. They double-crossed the chairman who they knew it had this problem with redlining in the district, and they were doing the same thing to one of the uh, counties. Uh, as a result, it was one of the circumstances that has led me to engage in the present process of reauthorizing the entire agency and holding the agency much stronger to account on its reporting requirements to us. It was, it was a total betrayal of trust. And the gentlelady wants to say something on this regard, to this regard. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. What I do want to say is that I'm from Maryland, and I represent both Prince George's and Montgomery County. And the last thing that I want to do is to set up a competition between the counties. And that's why the imperative of fairness and parity in the GSA process is so important. Because I know that, for Madam Chairwoman, the, the developers that you represent and the interests that you represent here in the District of Columbia and I in Prince George's and Montgomery County and my, my colleagues, we just want a level playing field and we want to know what the rules are. And we want to know that when the rules are placed in order that the, the developers and the interests in our districts understand what they are and that people are playing by the rules. And what the chairwoman has described is a circumstance where there were no rules. And in fact, to the extent there were, they were changed in the middle of the game. And that's not fair to anybody, not to any of our jurisdictions, and nor is it fair to those who want to compete for GSA leases. And so you can be assured that um, I, and, and I know that the chairwoman, on this subcommittee are going to be looking at, at these issues in great detail because um, looking at our region, and one only has to look, I think the Brookings Institute did a study several years ago called the Region Divided, and when you look at the dots on the map, you can see the disinvestment, and that disinvestment is happening in a county that I represent. And so, there will be additional questions, and I hope that the agency is both held to account and then displays the kind of parity, fairness, and transparency that the, that the taxpayer deserves and certainly that the people of the 4th Congressional District deserve. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I thank you, Ms. Ms., 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 Ms. Edwards. I do want to say that we, <laughs> the, 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 the gentlelady uh, 
uh, makes a point. She's, she represents both counties, and she's not trying to put one, uh, one county against the other. But I need to tell the general, <laughs> the general lady that I am. I'm trying to put all the counties in play. Uh, I have put all parts of the District of Columbia in play. I mean, if Kate Street comes up with a lower figure and better space, too bad, Noma. Too bad the other area that we've encouraged to develop down by M Street. Sorry, that's exactly what we want. We want the best deal for the government. I want Prince George's in it. I see some explored, unexplored opportunity for price reduction, uh, for encouraging. Uh, uh, there was going to be new space here. This man was going to have to build. So your notion about, hey, uh, as if Virginia had the um, smarts to build and Prince George's did not. On the contrary, uh, Virginia got the contracts to build and they built. That's the only way Virginia has gotten it. So that has left an opportunity. We see where there's an what happens when there's an opportunity. Let me tell you about opportunity. During uh, the fiscal crisis in the District of Columbia, uh, real estate uh, collapsed in uh, one of the wards across the Anacostia, Ward 8. And so people abandoned the property and moved out and sold it for nothing. And look what we got happening in Ward 8 now. Smart folks like the federal government has not been swooped into Ward 8, saw that land prices were lower than they were in other parts of the district. We have whole new developments of middle class housing all through Ward 8. Now, we're asking for GSA to play that role. As it turns out, Prince George's County ain't Ward 8. <laughs> Prince George's County, and I repeat, is one of the most prosperous counties in the United States of America. And it got that way the same way that, that Fairfax got that way. All of them got that way because the federal presence moved out into the area. When the federal presence moved, moves out, all kinds of other businesses move out, and that's the way it happened. Same thing has happened in the District of Columbia. If the federal presence moves into an area of the district, that's the a good housekeeping government seal of approval and others come. So where you already are set up for success, because that you have one of the most highly educated workforces in one of your counties, then I say she can, I understand it, and I'm not trying to put her, her in competition with one part of her constituency or, or the other, but I can say, let's get it on. Let's, let's, let's get it on. Between all of the counties that are likely places for new construction to be built, where we're building new construction, and that happens all the time, so that we have a fair uh, to the government yeah, we want to be fair to Prince George's, but guess what? I want to be fair first and foremost to the government and wearing her federal hat, that's exactly what uh, the representative from Prince George's wants. So you've got, you, you've had to take this tongue, tongue lashing because you're here <laughs> uh, before us. But we wanted to put it on the record so it, it, it can be clear that we're not going to take the assurances from the um, agency any longer. We're going to put it into law. We're going to hold the government. If this agency ever does to us what it did to Prince George's, because when they did it to Prince George's, they did to us, we're going to hold you in contempt because it was a contemptible act. In any case, sir, uh, you can take that tongue lash and give it to the rest of the folks back there. I hear you, <laughs> Madam Chairman, <laughs> loud and clear. Cool. We call them all before us right in my office. And, and, and told them what we thought of the, the violation of trust between us. And they needn't violate trust with me because I have been the prime defender of this agency. I've respected its expertise. And so when the agency double crosses me, believe me, I ain't got no friends up here then. And I expect to be treated with the kind of respect that the Prince George's County uh, episode tell, tells me I was not treated with, uh, that the subcommittee was not treated with, and frankly, Prince George's was treated with contempt, and I believe it was redlined, and I will not go any further than to say redlined. You know what that means. I think that's what happened. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony, and I want to go on to the, the next uh, or the last panel of witnesses, very important to us. Uh, Richard Fratell, uh, Chair and Chief uh, 
chief officer, uh, uh, CEO of, of BOMA, uh, Mitchell Share, DC Downtown uh, Business Development District, also also is a president of what? Bernardo Development, uh, and uh, Dean Schwank, Schwanke, Senior Vice President, Urban Land Institution, Institute. We are pleased to receive uh, your testimony. Uh, as to who should proceed first, I'm not sure we have any, uh, I, I'm not sure we have any, um, chosen order, so I'll, I'll, shall I just go from my left, my own left, to my right, or would any of you like to proceed first? Mrs. Schwanke, am I, am I saying your name right, sir? Schwanke. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Ranking Member Diaz-Ballard, and uh, the rest of the sub sub subcommittee members. Um, my name is Dean Schwanke, I'm the Senior Vice President for Publication and, and Awards at the Urban Land Institute here in Washington, D.C., in Georgetown. We're a non-for-profit association with 38,000 members around the country and the world, primarily involved in development and investment in the real estate industry. Our mission is to provide leadership and the responsible use of land and in creating and sustaining thriving communities worldwide. Um, pertaining to the cur current real estate environment, uh, we've been over a lot of this already, but I'll go over some of the things that we see. Uh, the current financial crisis and the economic recession are pulling the commercial real estate sector into a very difficult business environment characterized by numerous negative trends, including the following. Increasing vacancy rates, falling rents, dwindling development prospects, lack of available capital for lending, stricter underwriting, falling property values, sluggish investment in transaction markets, increasing loan delinquencies and foreclosures, and growing distress for property owners. With these trends, while these trends are bad for commercial real estate industry, they present somewhat more favorable environments for tenants as the availability of space and increasing while, uh, is increasing while rents are declining. Uh, of particular interest to the GSA is the office sector. A couple of facts here. Office vacancy rates in the U.S. have risen from 12.8% in the fourth quarter of 2007 to 14.7% in the fourth quarter of 2008, according to one estimate, and others are even higher. And some estimates suggest that vacancy rates will go to 18 to 20% by the end of 2010, which creates quite a favorable environment for tenants. Uh, office rent growth has turned negative in the latter part of 2008, and negative rent growth is expected to continue well into 2010 and probably longer, depending on how the economy performs. Uh, increasing vacancy and falling rents will translate directly into reduced income for commercial properties, uh, which will put strains on operating budgets, reduce values, and create distress for owners. Uh, so commercial real estate developers are facing dismal a period. Financing has evaporated for new construction, demand is falling, and projects coming online will struggle to lease up falling short of forecasts. By one estimate, office completions in 2010 will total only about one-third of the completions in 2008. And completions are expected to remain at low levels in two, until 2012. So we'll have a real shortage of new space coming online over that period of time. Uh, turning to the capital markets, the lack of liquidity in the financial sector has been well documented, and this problem is particularly severe for the commercial real estate sector as it's a ca capital-intensive business. Uh, perhaps most important for real estate capital markets are the problems in the commercial mortgage-backed securities market. Uh, CMBS issuance grew dramatically over the past 10 years and as of early 2008 had come to be a huge source of debt capital for commercial real estate with over $230 billion of CMBS issuance in 2007 alone. However, there has been no new issuance of CMBS since the second quarter of 2008, zero. And it is unlikely this critical source of commercial real estate debt capital will be revived anytime soon. In addition to the lack of capital availability, underwriting standards have shifted drastically and the cost of debt capital has gone up. Commercial mortgage interest rates spreads have, over treasuries have increased substantially. Bank underwriting standards and equity requirements are now much more demanding and conservative. Moreover, property values have declined not only because of declining fundamentals, but also due to rising capital, capitalization rates and lack of investor confidence. Uh, further declines are likely for several more quarters, if not years. As a result of all these trends, refinancing of any commercial mortgage coming due will be extremely difficult for most property owners in 2009 and 2010. Many borrowers with loans coming due will find themselves unable to obtain suitable financing as any new financing sources will require more equity and charge higher interest rates than many borrowers can manage, especially if the property's value has declined, which will occur in some cases. As a result, many owners will find themselves in distressed situations 
and will either lose the property to the lender or will sell the property at a distressed price level. This can and will happen even to owners with, prop even to owners with properties that are performing well. And the problem will severely impact a large number of commercial real estate owners, investors, lenders that have used leverage to finance properties. So what does this mean for, for GSA? Uh, the current environment presents both opportunities and problems. Uh, on the negative side, because of the lack of financing, it will be more difficult for developers to develop new buildings to meet specific GSA standards and requirements, as you've already talked about. Although GSA, GSA is certainly a strong credit tenant for any proposed development deal and will make any such deal look much better than most others. Uh, moreover, the lack of new speculative buildings in the market, which tend to be more green and energy efficient, will inhibit GSA's ability to find the most technically advanced green and energy efficient space uh, through the leasing process. However, the retrofitting of existing buildings to be more green and energy efficient will proceed, we think, as owners seek to upgrade their buildings to compete in a difficult market that is increasingly demanding such space. Uh, GSA can certainly be a leader in hastening this trend as it has been in the past. On the positive side, <clears throat> availability and choice in office space markets is improving while costs are decreasing, as we've discussed. And the 2009-10 period will certainly be a tenant's market, if not into 11 and 12. Rents and occupancy costs will decline and stabilize at attractive levels for several years. Thus, the next two years should provide an excellent environment for leasing new space or renew renewing or renegotiating leases at attractive terms. Moreover, attractive acquisition opportunities will present themselves in a transaction market where there will be distressed sellers and few buyers. GSA could find attractive buying opportunities and could potentially acquire quality, well-located well office buildings for its own use at greatly reduced prices. Uh, that's, that's my testimony, and thank you, Madam Chair and uh, subcommittee members. I uh, appreciate being here. Thank you, Mr. Swank. Uh, Mr. Scheer, am I pronouncing your, your name correctly, Mr. Scheer? Uh, Scheer, thank you. Mr. Scheer. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to be part of today's session. My name is Mitchell Scheer, and I've been active in the downtown bid since its formation in 1997. Uh, the downtown bid is a non-for-profit corporation that works to improve one square mile of downtown Washington, D.C., to include 62 million square feet of office space within that area, GSA owns 17 million square feet and leases an additional 7 million square feet. I'm also president of Vornado Charles E. Smith, which is the Washington division of Vornado Realty Trust. We are the largest lessor of office space to the federal government in the Washington, D.C. area. Vornado is one of the largest owners, developers, and managers of real estate in the United States with a portfolio over 100 million square feet. Um, your decision to hold this hearing today is um, timely because these discussions are taking place um, all across the, the sector and people are focused on these issues. Um, what I'd like to do is um, just recognize uh, Representative Norton and this committee and GSA for their work on behalf of DC and the region. Um, and on a lighter note, um, Representative um, Norton, I'd like to uh, congratulate you on your performance um, as Glenda uh, earlier this week um, in the arena stage benefits. So, um, having said that, I'd like to skip over my formal testimony and, and having listened to the um, exchange back and forth, I'd just like to make several observations. Um, I'd like to reiterate that this is really um, an extraordinary time for GSA to be leasing space in the marketplace. There are great opportunities for the government to take advantage of and basically, as you, as you were saying before, you know, come at us, you know, we've got the space, we're gonna compete against one another, and, um, you know, demand is what we're looking for. It's also a great time for GSA to buy. Um, and I think uh, what I would say, it's not only good for the government to buy, it's also good uh, from the owner's standpoint for GSA to buy, because what the government will be doing is putting liquidity into the market, putting cash into the market, and if you look at um, companies and the amount of capital that, that then comes back out, then they can use that money for other purposes as well. So we think there's a win-win um, a situation out there. Um, I would also just like to add, as you talk about these new projects, because you know, we, we think you will see very little um, construction taking place, that really new projects are not really economic in the marketplace today. And I think the reason we would say that is threefold. One is um, due to the rents that would be uh, required to be paid uh, by the government in particular. 
um, due to construction financing and permanent financing. You need both pieces of that puzzle. Do you, do you, Did you say due to the rents that the government would be required? Yeah, in other words, let me finish. So what happens is because of the availability of um, debt and the cost of the debt and the rents that would then be paid, there's basically would be a, a current disconnect so that the developer would not go forward with a project, generally speaking. And then finally, the third reason that the projects, new projects would not go forward is there's really going to be an abundance of space that's existing or under construction already. So I think that that's just not an avenue that will necessarily be pursued um, by the private sector in the near term. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Patrell, Patel. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dick Patel, Portfolio Manager for Grub Analysis Management Service. And I'm here today in my role as Chair and Chief Elected Officer of the Building Owners and Managers Association International and our local association here in Washington, the Apartment and Office Building Association of Metropolitan Washington, D.C. As the district's congresswoman, you may be interested to know that uh, AOBA's members own or manage 75% of the city's private office space and that one-third of the city's privately owned space is leased by GSA. When I appeared before you last summer at a hearing on the credit crunch, it was already clear that our nation was in a downward spiral and the commercial real estate industry was beginning to feel the pinch. Unfortunately, there's no good news. Today, the roughly six and a half trillion dollar income producing U.S. property market faces its worst liquidity challenge since the Great Depression. With virtually no liquidity, commercial borrowers face a growing challenge of refinancing, maturing debt, and the threat of rising foreclosures and delinquencies. Through the end of 2009, an estimated 200 to 500 billion dollars in commercial and multifamily real estate loans will mature from a variety of sources. Over the next few years, these maturities increase to well over $1 trillion. We are faced with the dual challenge of developing strategies to stop the downward spiral and restoring confidence in the markets. While the incremental measures taken to date to address the crisis may have fortified the balance sheets of certain financial institutions, they have failed to address the root cause of the problem. It is imperative to enact measures that will enable financial institutions to effectively restructure their balance sheets to take toxic assets off banks' books and to start lending again on solidly underwritten transactions. By stabilizing financial institutions and restoring confidence to the credit markets, commerce will once again move forward, but the time to act is now. We are encouraged by the creation of the TALF and, and the Public-Private Investment Fund if engineered properly, these programs could provide credit markets with the economic confidence they need to reconnect in the wake of a broad dislocation and help restart the stalled economy. The cost of not taking immediate action grows higher with each passing day. Real estate directly and indirectly generates economic activity equivalent to nearly 20 percent of the nation's gross domestic product. Nearly nine million jobs are created from real estate activities which annually generate millions of dollars in federal, regional, and local tax revenues. Local governments especially depend on this revenue, which amounts to approximately 70 cents on every local budget dollar, to pay for public services such as education, road construction, law enforcement, and emergency planning and response. Beyond these industry-wide credit issues, there are some specific areas where private sector and the public building sector could effectively work together for our mutual benefit. First, we congratulate Congress for allocating funds to the General Service Administration to implement energy efficiency retrofits in federal buildings. We would like to suggest that these ret retrofits not be limited to federally owned buildings, but also be allocated to make needed retrofits of space that government leases from the private sector. The building owner will benefit from capital improvements made to the building. The federal government will benefit from improved high-performance space while demonstrating leadership and new technologies, and taxpayers will benefit from job creation and improving our environment. We would also like to call attention to a growing problem 
of the government's overuse of short-term lease extensions. With increasing frequency, the U.S. government is asking its commercial landlords to enter into short-term extensions at the end of the lease term, instead of renegotiating the lease or giving notice to vacate the space according to the termination terms of the lease. It is standard market practice to give anywhere from six months to four years advance notice of the intention to vacate or renew a lease prior to the lease expiration. Some of our members have estimated that currently 60 percent of the government leases enter into these makeshift holdover arrangements upon lease expiration. This practice happens for a variety of reasons. In some cases, the future space needs have not been addressed by GSA's client agencies, which can be due to budget uncertainty or the agency's growing pains. Also, the lengthy process for securing congressional authorization for GSA's large deals goes through the prospectus process, and this can cause delays or get bogged down in bureaucracy. While the causes may be understandable, the result can be costly for both the federal government and for the landlord. Leasebacks carry a large penalty, typically 50 percent above the rent they were paying before lease expiration. The government deprives itself of the ability to obtain the best financial terms and a full range of options in the marketplace. This practice is also problematic for the landlord. If the building is trying to secure financing, potential lenders will treat the space as vacant in the absence of a lease. A vacant or underutilized building will have a low income stream and therefore impact the credit worthiness of the building, which in turn leads to onerous loan terms. In addition, the landlord cannot market the space to potential clients without the knowledge of the tenant's intentions to vacate the space. It can also affect other tenants in the building who may have expansion rights in their leases. The government has always been a valued tenant and customer of the private sector real estate community. Due to their credit worthiness and the guarantee of payment, many landlords are willing to make significant accommodations for government lease tenancy. However, in the present economy, the increasing practice of lease holdovers is creating additional distress. We encourage the subcommittee to consider ways to help streamline GSA's leasing practices and eliminate unnecessary bureaucracy. We support full and open competition, but with sufficient time remaining on the lease to eliminate the uncertainty and upheaval to the landlord. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Patron. I must say all three of you have given a, a virtual catalog, very in, in, in very synopsis form of, of not only the market today, but of areas where we, we should be um, particularly conscious to look. The testimony is therefore particularly helpful to us, and, and I'd like to begin with some questions. Um, Mr. Mr. Patrell, I believe, uh, in, in, in your testimony at page four, I mean, you take that question I was putting to um, our GSA witness right through the scenario that makes us see both sides of the issue and come to grips with what, what's at play here. Um, indeed, if uh, BOMA uh, has within its BOMA portfolio, so to speak, 90% of the leased uh, space in this region, um, and third of it leased by right. GSA, that says everything about why we've got to look at this credit markets just as you'd look at it, perhaps even more so given the way we are affected across the board. Uh, just let me begin with the lengthy process, because with my government hat on, GSA knows I'm going to insist that it go through, uh, as you yourself mentioned, the uh, competitive process. That gets us the best deal uh, for sure. But the, we are particularly interested in really outside the box thinking about how to do things that meet the government's Com competition requirements and other regulatory requirements, while at the same time doing so speedily. My only, in my great interest in government and coming to the federal government was, was precisely. I came as a lawyer, to a very troubled agency, the Equal Employment Agency, uh, and started a practice which, 
my kind of allies in the various movements uh, uh, shrunk at, at and that, I looked at it, I, th I saw the cases, the large cases where the payback was, where you'd want to bring a systemic charge. And then I saw where the agency was putting its time into uh, cases of individuals that deserve full attention from the government, but uh, for lack of a better term, I would call nickel and dime cases. And because they were nickel and dime cases and because they had a very open process, uh, there were almost no remedies because people could file very easily. And, and so I started a, a, um, a settlement process whereby very early you brought both sides together when both sides are in doubt and put the investigators to work call, calling out to each side what the areas of doubt were. We ended up uh, with uh, a larger, much larger remedy rate uh, for those who brought grievances, who if they'd gone through, some of them in fact would have gotten something, uh, but um, more of the en energy, uh, more of the um, agency's resources going into where the biggest payoff was. So I have my major interest is in uh, the jigsaw puzzle of making government regulation meet the standards of keeping the ball moving. Now, um, I, when, when, when you heard our first witness describe what he went through, and then of course you have to, to advertise because there may be somebody who comes forward that even when you factor in all your moving costs and so forth, it makes sense to, to move out. Um, and just knowing nothing about the process, I said, well, you know, the market conditions, why you have to do that every time, you know what those are, they don't, they don't change. In fact, you don't want to change on a day-to-day -day basis. You want to have market conditions in, I hope not even the quarter, but in, in some larger time frame. And so you really don't have that many expenses to look at to make a judgment. I don't know if, if any of you have a suggestion you'd like to offer at this time, but I'd like to know any suggestions you have for streamlining that process where we've had so much concern, this what we're calling the holdover process, uh, what, what amounts to leases for short term, which also are not in the interest of anyone concerned, whether you can offer any suggestions for streamlining that particular process? I would, I would just start to say that I think, uh, you know, back in, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, and, and I've worked with GSA leases in a number of cases. I, I think one of the, in the previous testimony, you, uh, there was comments about, I think, uh, looking at leases expiring six to 12 months. I think the process needs to start a lot sooner than, than that. Uh, so so one, one of the most obvious things you could do is to start yeah. <laughs> earlier than when the I, thing is about to expire in the first abs place. Absolutely. So I how think, much earlier? Uh, well, right now I'm, I'm working with tenants uh, uh, and the properties I'm responsible for about two years in advance of that process. And it just it takes a while. Even, you know, GSA has its own uh, issues to deal with, but even the private uh, sectors of companies I'm working with, it takes a while to get through uh, a significant lease renewal. So I would, I would highly recommend you start that process uh, sooner. Um, uh, Madam Chair, I think um, uh, really not for me to necessarily suggest how for the General Service Administration or for the Congress to, to attack this, but you asked for outside the box ideas, so I'm going to throw one out there for you. I'm serious. Um, okay. The, the situation, I think, is such that if you, you asked GSA if they had enough resources um, to, to take care of everything, and I think the, the, the answer was, um, was not a resounding yes um, in terms of that. So if you take a look at today's marketplace and you look at all the real estate professionals who are unemployed because of what has happened, and those, you know, you have them right here in this region, you have them in every region, um, because there's been, you know, they're very qualified, capable people. So I guess the question would be is, might there be some resources available, perhaps on a short-term basis, where the government would either hire or contract um, some additional resources so that instead of, um, and what they could perhaps do is catch up once, if you will. So if they're working right now on leases that are already in holdover, um, then they can't quite get ahead, as we've suggested on the, on the deals that are two and three years out. 
So it's possible that there could be a one-time sort of cleanup, if you will, and then begin to try and yeah. get further and further. And Mr. Mr. Chair, just as Mr. <coughs> Patrell suggested a common sense notion, hey, start a little earlier, and, you won't, and the problem, a large part of the problem will take care of itself. Your notion is about backlog. That, by the way, is exactly what I met at the EOC, 100,000 a case backlog. So no matter how much I streamline this process in the front end, I'm still going to end up with a backlog. So we just separate it out to backlog cases and say we will proceed on a backlog strategy that is different from the other strategy takes into account uh, other factors. Now, I don't, you're right about their own personnel. They have been bled dry. And it may be that for on a short-term basis, something like that could be done. But that's the kind of thing we're looking to. If you're serious about it, you don't keep the, filling the backlog and then congratulating them for getting rid of the new cases. Uh, you try to find a way to clear the decks so that the, 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 the new procedures can, in fact, click in. Uh, Mr. Schwank, I'm, I'm nervous about exactly what, what you indicated in your testimony. Uh, you say in page five, uh, that financing of any commercial mortgage is coming due will be extremely difficult for most property owners in 2009 and 2010. Many commercial real estate loans are structured as five-year loans and thus for these types of loans, roughly 40% of the loans will be coming due in the next two years. I mean, that reminds me of the subprime mortgage crisis, although these are not necessarily, some of these, by the way, are securitized loans, but these certainly are not the same kinds of things. What is going to happen? What do any of you think is going to happen? Do you think that they will, those who hold these loans will see that they're all in the same boat, boat and will negotiate their way out of, out of this uh, problem that apparently you see as, as uh, uh, large scale? Yes, I think it is large scale and no one really knows how we're going to get through it, uh, uh, especially the, the securitized loans which are, are set up with with uh, servicers that have certain requirements they have to follow and may not be able to renego renegotiate that loan as a bank might be able may to. May not be able to do so because what did you say? Because saying? they have certain rules they have to abide by because these securities are held by a whole set of owners in the securitized mortgage market and they have rules they have to follow and they don't have a lot of, a lot of leeway like Would a I bank stop you have. there? Uh, does the, is the, you know, the government has had to help uh, with this in the private sector. Uh, do, do, you, do you believe the government may have some role to play uh, here for, uh, I mean, we see 40% of these loans then take down office space in large cities across the United States. Somebody would wish they come, had come up with some way to, to do something here. And I don't, I'm not sure anybody's paying much attention at those levels because we're so, we're so occupied, preoccupied here with what's on the plate now. Yeah, if something's not done, I mean, this could be the next wave of problems. It's, it's a mortgage-backed security. It's a commercial mortgage-backed security, just like the, the other mortgage-backed mortgage -backed securities that are causing all the problems with the subprime. Uh, it, it, it's a much healthier market. It didn't have the same kind of problems that the subprime. These are all were generally good loans when they were made. Uh, but they're going to go into the distress situation simply because of the, of the economics of the marketplace now where property values are These are people are who could pay. These but are not people who are in, in distress. Generally. Well, they're going to be in distress because property values are going down, interest rates are going up, uh, and what they're, they're asked to put back into the next refinancing deal is going to be way more than what they had in it to start Whereas with. Whereas if this were a bank, they could, of course, neg neg negotiate in keeping with this, the state of the market. Yes. yes, and even some banks won't negotiate these. So it's, some of my colleagues here can probably talk to this better than I. Mr. Chair, Mr. Portrell. Uh, well, I, I would just comment that uh, that is correct. Many of these uh, loans that we're dealing with that are going to be refinanced are interest-only loans. So the impact of, the, of value when those come due is going to that's going to play out. Uh, just an example: statistics here in the metropolitan D.C. area. Uh, in the next five years, there's 21 billion dollars of these loans alone in this area. How much? 21 billion. It's that, that of these course. securitized just, loans? Yeah, in this, in this market alone. So it's it, hard the next, to, yeah. by 2013. So, so that's uh, it's, it's going to obviously play out In this regional here. market alone. Yes. Yeah. And, and do you have any idea of how, how much of that space would be government occupied? I don't have those statistics. So. Uh, we, will, yeah. we will ask look into GSA that. to, yeah. look, to yeah. look into We'd that. We'd be glad to help them do that. But, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, did you have anything to say on that score? Uh, nothing additional. Um, let, let me ask you, Mr. Uh, Chair, how do you believe 
that even with a GSA lease or uh, 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 whether you believe or for that matter whether any of you believe um, that if you have a lease or a federal tenant, they're still going to have trouble getting financing. I, I think federal government lease where with the fair, with the good faith of the federal government behind it. And, and and will that have an effect on the cost of credit? Will that ha itself, would it have a f an effect on credit availability? Are you, uh, are you thinking in terms of new construction or refinancing an existing or both? First new construction, then refinancing. Uh... Okay, I, I think that um, in terms of new construction, I think clearly if anything is going to get financed, it's going to be a, um, a federal government lease. But I think in today's market, in, in this month of this year, um, it is near, nearly impossible to get financing for a new project, um, even with a government lease. Now, a, a, new, a new project with a government lease, with the government behind the project, what makes it difficult to get a loan in that case? Just, just simply the scarcity of, um, of lending capital available, the number of lenders who are willing to lend. Um, as Even we, to the as government, which is financing so many of them. Th that's what I would say. I'm not sure if either of my panelists would um, suggest otherwise. Uh, certainly, you could find yourself in a situation where, where uh, well, the cost of construction in, uh, is going to be higher than what the rents are going to support, basically. And, on, and on, in a leasing situation, you can see a situation develop where uh, if the loan is coming due and a lease is coming due at the same time, and in the market is a situation where the, the rents go down and the owner still has to cover the cost of his debt, and then he can't, and he has to put more equity into it, he's got less income, and you can see he's in a distressed situation. And that's situation. the problem we were describing right. before, how this is all circular, and you've got to have somebody who can pay, and the and yet, with the cost going down, uh, the 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 um, market going down, that that controls the square footage, uh, the cost per square foot, which isn't enough to take care of the higher cost of credit and debt. It does present an opportunity, I think, where if, if the GSA is in a building that becomes in a distressed situation, uh, and they have to sell, GSA could be a buyer and get a very good price on that, and not have to move and, and find themselves in a you know, attractive uh, market situation. Now, the GSA testified that, well, yes, but that might depend upon the location and the rest. Should it really? I mean, if you've got a rock bottom price in an area where you usually need uh, some, uh, some um, space, should you be that picky about, <laughs> uh, well, we can't meet the, you know, that's not exactly what agencies are looking for at this time. I mean, how would a, private uh, party uh, look at that market when um, he l leases all over a, a defined region uh, may need more uh, for the moment in Fairfax than in Prince George's, but there are some uh, uh, properties in Prince George's that are uh, particularly uh, favorably priced, how would somebody, leave aside GSA for the moment, look at that as an opportunity or a risk? Well, it depends on what, what kind of leasing is in place. If it's an empty building, it would be a huge risk because you'd have the risk of leasing it up, and in this market that would be very difficult. But if no, it's we're a, assuming that we're talking to the government. Right, and okay, the, so. And the government, that the government needs spaces all the time because, as you've heard, these, some of these leases expire. People would like to move somewhere else, and the question of getting new space, you've just testified, is not going to be easy. So here comes a, 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 a building. Maybe it's one of these buildings you just, you just testified about. They, they, the, the arm, as it were, became due, and so they just can't meet it. So there, there that building springs up in D.C., Prince George's, Montgomery County. What if you had the money like, <laughs> like the government does? Uh, and we're weighing the risks and opportunities. Would you regard, what would you regard as the risk and what would be the opportunity of any? Well, if you have an empty office building that the GSA can fill, 
that's a golden opportunity and it meets your specifications. Now, a lot of these buildings won't necessarily do that. They're not going to be trans-oriented. They're going to be out on a highway somewhere. They're going to be empty. They're going to be yeah, empty Yeah, so I'm reason. assuming those would be off. You yeah. have to be our own procurement rules say right. you have to be, um, <laughs> as Ed Edwards will tell you, you have to be near a subway and we tell you the exact number of feet. So I'm assuming all of that is in order. Uh, okay. and, and in fact, we know where people build. They build because they want us to come in the first place. So do understand that. They, they, the first and foremost kind of tenant they want is the federal government. So assume all of that's in place, but you don't have a tenant at the moment. Uh, you may not even have the money at the moment. You may have to come and say to Norton, can you help us because this is this would save the government a gazillion dollars, whatever it is. If you could get hold of the money, my question is, even though there not, may not be somebody right now who wants that space in that, in the, in, 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 in that place, is this for a big time lessor or developer a, a risk or is it an opportunity? If, if, I, um, if I can, uh, if I think I understand the question, if, if capital were available and the government were available to lease, um, that's a win-win-win for, you know, for everybody. So I think that there, regardless, um, as long as it meets the requirements, then I think that that would absolutely be a, a good thing. We, we're trying to orient the GSA to think in a down market what the advantages did. The obvious disadvantages have come out in, in this, uh, in, in this very hearing, but the terrible disadvantage of having someone who's prepared to pay, continue to pay on his mortgage, but the sh short-term mortgage has become due, is hard for me to see as a benefit to somebody in the market there. I don't see the benefit to the lender. I don't see the benefit, of course, to the builder put in that position, but heaven help us, it may be a benefit <laughs> to the GSA if it positions itself to take advantage of it instead of having to come up with a procurement <laughs> or building it doesn't own uh, every time and then lease it and still it doesn't own it. And then, by the way, it keeps on leasing it until it buys it several times over. Those are the kinds of practices we're trying to get ri rid of. Uh, um, should the government, in short, have an investment strategy of its own? If you were just off the top of your head, you haven't had time to think through this question, but if you were to advise the government today on an investment strategy. And one of you, I think it was Mrs. Schwank, testified of a reasonable financing strategy for the federal government. What, bearing in mind that, that we lease and sometimes we have to construct uh, entirely new space for an agency, what would be your um, investment strategy given where the federal government and the market are at this point in time? Well, I would suggest it's, it's a great time to buy over the next year. It'll be a great time to buy commercial real estate if you're going to use that real estate. It's a win-win. You don't have to take a risk if you can occupy the space. And it will not only serve the government well by being, allowing them to acquire space at very greatly reduced prices, but it will also help the overall commercial real estate market by putting a floor under uh, prices of buildings. If there's a buyer in the marketplace willing to buy at a certain level, that's a floor that, that is there right now. No one quite knows where the floor is going to be, uh, and that's bad for their. That's bad for the commercial real estate market. It's bad for the banks and all the lenders that are lending into that market. So you can serve two purposes with one, uh, by by buying low and propping, being a market maker essentially. I, I think uh, simply stated, if you are a user of space in today's marketplace, an investment strategy would be uh, to be opportunistic and take advantage of today's. Um, current situation. Uh, Ms. Edwards, can I ask if you have any questions? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you to our uh, panelists uh, today. It's been a very illuminating conversation, and I think one of the points of illumination, and I hope that uh, our colleagues have heard that, is the warning, uh, a very similar warning that we received from the FDIC three, four years ago about the um, the subprime market and the securitization that was taking place in that in that market and the impending disaster and w what we've heard right now is that we have a a lot of commercial backed securities that are maturing and need refinancing over the next 5 years and it's a boatload 
and the credit markets are closed in. Um, and so the capacity to refinance in this situation is dire. Um, and we're talking about loans that are good. Um, I think when we looked at the housing market, we saw a housing market where at first we started out with a subprime problem and we have quickly deteriorated into a prime problem. And with, again, a shrinkage of, um, of credit. And this is really scary. Um, and so thank you uh, for, um, for that because it's a bit of an illumination for me. Um, I, I, my questions actually have to do with um, looking at, the, at uh, the GSA sort of lease plan and the lease versus buy options. I'm reminded that a few years ago, I actually, um, for a nonprofit that had cash, uh, was looking at leasing space and then decided because in 2000, it was a horrible commercial market. There was space available all over this city. Got a great deal on a building over um, in, uh, on DuPont Circle, you know, retrofitted the building, and it's a good deal right now. And it seems to me GSA is in exactly that kind of, uh, kind of position, whether it's positioned to take advantage of that or has the capacity and the analysis to do that or not. Um, so again, I appreciate your um, pointing out those options. Uh, I wonder if there, if when you look at um, what the possibilities are for uh, for GSA, if you have some recommendations, um, yeah, you know, you've made a couple about how to proceed from here because I think we're in a little bit of a quandary. We know that it's a buyer's market. We know that it's a, you know, in some ways a landlord's market, um, but we don't seem to be able to take advantage of it. How do we do it? Well, I think the first way, and I would suggest Mr. Shear made a, a great suggestion on the out-of-the-box thinking, was to uh, uh, assist the GSA in some of that backlog by uh, getting the expertise that maybe it's not there right now so you can deal with that. Because obviously the opportunity won't last forever. And so I think the next 12 months are critical to, to make, uh, take some steps to deal with that. And do we have some, do you have some sense though of what, I mean, I don't even, and I wasn't quite sure GSA knows sort of what the, has a handle on the numbers of leases that are coming to, um, to term. Um, because I don't know how you both, you know, as, as the chairwoman has pointed out, deal with what's ahead when you haven't dealt with what's, um, with what's behind. And it wasn't clear to me that whether it's using technology or something else, that GSA fully has a grasp on, on the magnitude uh, so, that, you know, so that they can deal with issues of capacity. I think that the um, clearly, um, I'm certain GSA um, prior to today has been thinking about these matters. You all have made it very clear to them. The industry is is available to work with them. It's it's easy for us all to sit here and say there are great big opportunities out there, but to then match a specific situation mm -hmm. to a specific um, requirement really is a challenge for a whether you're in the private sector or in the public sector. So I think that um, that that will be seen as time goes on. We should make sure whatever resources are available and see if, in fact, those kinds of situations will emerge. If they emerge in, you know, in two of 15 situations and something's able to be done on an opportunistic basis, that, that may be a great standard as opposed to not being able to take advantage of any. So I think that um, we'll have to see how, how it plays out really in the trenches because it's really not that um, we, we can't sort of look on it from on high and say, you know, hey, just go do it. Mm -hmm. I, can, I mean, I can appreciate that. Just one last question. It's about retrofitting for energy savings versus new construction. And I'm just really unclear about, the, uh, about how you assess the cost because, uh, you know, we hear all the time, and you've, some of you have said it, you've said in your testimony that you know, retrofitting buildings might be a more effective strategy than new construction just because of the, the gaps in the, the rents that would be available and the new construction financing. But if you factor over a period of time, and I don't know what that period of time is, how much 
energy savings that you might get by building new and green, is there some parity in the retrofitting versus new construction? Well, I think you know, retrofitting, clearly you have an asset in place, so it's greener to use an asset in place than it is to build something new. Um, and strictly from an energy efficiency point of view, the payoff should be pretty good over a short period of time. If you start going into other greener things that are more costly and don't get into cost savings, operating savings, that's another question. But clearly, uh, from an energy efficiency point of view, I think it's, it's uh, something we'll see a lot more of because building operators are going to want to reduce their costs and they can then position their buildings as being more green. Clearly, the Obama administration is, is positioning uh, uh, the, the whole federal government to, take, to attack that issue and become more green. So I think it's a win-win, and a lot of building owners are seeing that as, as a, something they have to do, whether they are building new or, or a, an older building, retrofitting an older building. And if, especially if you find situations where a building becomes largely empty or, or it has enough flex in it so that they can start retrofitting space within uh, the empty space, then that gives them an opportunity to become more green. Uh, I know our offices, we, we turned into a green office uh, several years ago just because we wanted to, but uh, some others might have something to say. I, I think um, you're, you're um, right on sort of the forefront, and it's a really um, interesting and important and question that's not yet answered because I think we've all figured out how to build new green buildings. And I think the industry has, has advanced very rapidly in a very short period of time. So, so from ground up, I think we can, we can deliver um, really good quality, uh, sustainable product. In terms of the existing inventory, um, which is, is mostly what we're focused on, we're not going to be in a period of, of huge building, much more complicated to figure out within the existing inventory how to build efficiencies. So I think that is a question that the industry is focused on right now, looking at the cost effectiveness, looking at a whole variety of issues, and I think more to come in the, in the coming months on that front. Yep. Mr. Patel, yep. you actually specifically mentioned a desire to uh, retrofit leased buildings, which I think is a little bit more complicated, so I wonder if you could elaborate on well, that. Well, I, I guess the comment, and I would uh, just confirm what's been said before me, is that the existing building stock is, is you know, the biggest part of this discussion, and the opportunities are probably the biggest there as well, in that we have, it's aging, we have a lot of equipment that needs to be replaced, and I think this is another opportunity to potentially incentivize uh, those owners to do that and be more energy efficient uh, at the same time, so... But the government would only get, and the taxpayer, real benefit from that if there were really a long-term lease so that we actually get our, you know, sort of our bang for our buck as opposed to, you know, what could amount to essentially a windfall for, uh, you know, a leaseholder who then, you know, when a lease when the lease terminates, gets to lease out this great right. green building. Right. I can give you a, maybe a simplified example, but, uh, you know, the energy of uh, buildings in my market, the uh, energy cost is in near $2 a foot. So uh, regardless of if there's energy efficiency and we can save, uh, uh, you know, 10% by being more energy efficient, do the math on, on all the numbers and how that works. So uh, there is an opportunity. Uh, and immediately and for as long as they're there to uh, save money for, uh, for the taxpayer and, and uh, the GSA. I want to thank the general lady very much and I want to say to, uh, to all three of you uh, that first I appreciate your, your waiting us out um, as we um, went through the issues with our GSA representative. But that, that what to say as well, that as we try to think of what to do going forward, your testimony in particular has been of immeasurable value to us, and we thank you very much for it. Well, thank you. Thank you. This hearing is adjourned.